today I'll be reading from, this will be really easy to find, <laughs> Genesis 1. Yeah. And if you don't know, it's in the very front of your Bible. It's in the beginning. Very the beginning. It is in the beginning. That's true. So while you guys are turning there, I have a very short joke. Well, it's not really a joke. When we were in Ireland, my wife and I just recently, and um, I had purchased a mood ring. You know, you guys ever seen those rings that like change color, tell you your mood? And then I lost it, and I really don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> no drama. Okay. All right, there you go. All right. It takes a while for me to get it. That's okay, that's good. Later on today, they'll be driving around going, I get it. Sorry. This is from Genesis 1, chapters 1 through 5. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. Heavenly Father, Lord, I wish I could have been there that day. What an amazing thing to see you speak creation into existence. Lord, you are the only one I know that can take nothing and make something out of it. God, thank you for being who you are. And God, thank you for your word. Please bless Pastor Ron today as he, as he opens this up to us, Lord, and shows us more about the beginning of the Bible. In Jesus' name, amen. Chicken or the egg, okay? Well, Christians know the answer to that. It was a chicken. Of course, Adam was not created as a baby. He was an adult. Creation is understood in the Bible and for every society throughout most of the time, creation was the accepted idea. It is only recently that so-called science purported an anti-God rhetoric and some summed up it in a fallacious term called evolution. So, a little note here, if you reject creationism, then you reject the word of God. Creation is found in over 300 verses in the Bible. So you're telling me if it's evolution, then God was wrong 300 times. God is wrong zero times. To deny it means to deny the word of God. And we'll look up the chart there in a moment. I'll explain some of it to you concerning that. The world population today in 2019, and of course it's ever changing, it gets more and more. As the time that I wrote this message, it was 7,714,576,000. In 1999, we went over the 6 billion mark. In 1987, we went over the 5 billion mark. In 1974, population was 4 billion. In 1960, 3 billion. 1927, the great murderous row for the New York Yankees, okay? 2 billion. Sorry, I had to throw that in there. 1804, remember 1803, Louisiana Purchase, okay? 1804, 1 billion in the world. The year 1500, 450 million. The year 200 AD, 190 million. The time of Abraham, 2500 BC, 20 million people. That was it. It's hard to find anything before that time. And remember, there was a huge population change from Adam to the flood, and then with Noah and his family, it started once again with eight people. So we're going to be looking at this. 
It's a two-part message. I'm going to really hit the creation first of all today. Next week we're going to be talking more about the flood. So hopefully I can end in the right place anytime that you have a two-parter, you know, that type of thing. But it's really important here. So I have a PowerPoint on the patri patriarchs. Now if we look at that, and I, don't, I know some things look a little small. I understand that, so I'm just going to go over it with you. The first is Adam, and it has the number 930 in the middle because that's how long he lived. So from the fall of Adam and Eve, when they sinned, then the time started, 930 years he lived. And then we have Seth. Abel, of course, was murdered by Cain, his brother. This is only the godly line that we have on here. And Seth, of course, lived 912 years old. And then we have Enosh, 905. The other name, Canaan, is spelled that way, or Canaan, either way is fine, 910. Mahaliel, 895. Jared, 962. Enoch, only 365. What's wrong with this guy? Well, the Bible says Enoch was such a dedicated believer. He walked with the Lord and the Lord took him. Okay? Methuselah, the oldest person ever to live in this world, 969 years old. And then Lamech, 777. And then Noah, 950. We'll stop there for a moment. Now, I drew a blue line, and on the bottom I have Adam's death. And so, in other words, I want you to understand something. All of the patriarchs, Adam, Seth, Enosh, Canaan, Mahaliel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, and Lamech, not Noah, Lamech, they all knew Adam, and Adam knew them. They lived at the same time. For some reason, we think that Adam dies, and then that's not what it is. Look at the lines there. This is biblical from the Bible. We've taken the genealogies, and we count it out. So that means that Lamech, the father of Noah, knew Adam. That is tremendous. Tremendous, and we see that. Now let's look at the other line, the godly line. And Noah, of course, Noah is the thread between before the flood, and after the flood. And Noah, of course, had the godly son Shem. And then he had Arphaxad. Then he had Shelah. Then Eber. And then Peleg. Rule. Serug. Nahor. Terah, the father of Abraham, who lived to be 205. Abraham, 175. Isaac, 180. Jacob, 147. Levi, 137, Kohath, 133, Amron, 137, and I went down to Moses, 120. Now, if you notice here, the years start to get less. Noah was 950, his son Shem, 600, then it drops to 438, 433, Eber's 464, Peleg, 239, and so forth. Now, I drew another line and realized this that people all the way up to the birth of Jacob knew Shem, the son of Noah. And if you look at Noah, of course, he knew Shem, Arphaxad, Shelah, Eber, and he knew Ruel. He didn't, uh, uh, Peleg didn't know him, obviously, because he, or he did know, I'm sorry, and then he knew quite a bit as well. If you look at the patriarchs, they knew Noah. They knew Adam. Can you imagine going to great-great-grandfather's house, Adam, and having him tell the stories to you about walking in the garden with the Lord? Fantastic. Friends, we have an early, young earth. Yes, it's an old earth in age, and we'll explain that to you in a moment. And I want to show you where we get this from. In Genesis 5, 5 to, uh, verses 5 to 32, I'm going to read it very quickly here. Follow with me in the Bible. So all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. 
Seth lived 105 years and begot Enosh. After he begot Enosh, Seth lived 807 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Seth were 912 years and he died. Enosh lived 90 years and begot Canaan. After he begot Canaan, Enosh lived 815 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enosh were 905 years and he died. Canaan lived 70 years and begot Mahaliel. After he begot Mahaliel, Canaan lived 840 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Canaan were 910 years and he died. See what happens when you say he died? You're thinking that just like you maybe have never met your great father, grandfather or your great grandfather. No, they were living until that time, hence the chart. 15. Mahaliel lived 65 years and begot Jared. That's like a teenager, man. After he begot Jared, Mahaliel lived 800 years and th 830 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Mahaliel were 895 years and he died. Jared lived 162 years and begot Enoch. After he begot Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Jared were 962 years and he died. Second oldest man ever to live, Jared. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Wow. What a godly man Enoch must have been. Methuselah lived 187 years and begot Lamech. After he begot Lamech, Methuselah lived 700 82 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. Interesting note about Methuselah. The actual word Methuselah means when it comes, he shall die. When the flood came, he died. So as that first raindrop started happening, that's when he died. Lamech lived uh, 182 years and had a son and he called his name Noah, saying, This one will comfort us concerning our work and, and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord had cursed. After that, he begot Noah. Noah uh, Lamech lived 595 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Lamech were 775 years, and he died. And Noah was 500 years old when Noah begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. History, right in a nutshell. And when you can see it on the chart there, I think it helps you out a little bit on what the Word of God is talking about. So let's get into this thing here a little bit. And so as we look at this, of course, we see that God created these wonderful uh, things on this earth. We've already summed up the ages here. And let's realize that uh, Lamech, Noah's father, was about... 50 years old when Adam died. Incredible. 50 years old. So Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 and 28. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 and 28. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on this earth. Think about the conversations with Adam and Eve, and I don't know how old Eve lived to be, not sure, the Bible does not tell us, about walking with the Lord in the garden and about communicating with him about the time when they were in the state of innocence and the time when they chose to eat the forbidden fruit. If you were living back then, you'd surely ask, wouldn't you? And you'd probably say, Grandpa, what were you thinking about? Why did you listen to your wife? Amazing. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8. 
And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden of Eden. Oh, sin corrupted, huh? Now, just an interesting side note right here, please, and understand this. In Genesis 1, 27, 28, it says to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. This command was given to them before they sinned. Before they sinned. In other words, if Adam and Eve did not eat of the forbidden fruit, they could have had babies. Simple as that. They were told to do that. But of course, you know the story. They sinned first, and then they had their children. Just kind of interesting things that the Bible talks about. Verse 21 to 24 in uh, Genesis here. So after they sinned, it says also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, referring to the Trinity, about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, capital U.S., to know good and evil. And now let, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. If he ate that tree of life, we could still visit Adam and Eve today because they would have lived forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. And then 24, so he drove out the man and he placed cherubims at the east of the Garden of Eden and a flaming sword which turned every which way to guard the way of the tree of life until it was uprooted. Now, skeptics laugh at this. They think they have a better answer for creation called evolution. So we're going to go through some of these things here. As someone who believes in creation, there are two different types of creation that we can look at this morning. There's two theories concerning creation. I'm not saying creation is a theory. Within the confines of creation, there are two theories by Christians. Here's number one. The earth was created about 6,000 years ago. People don't buy into this because of the idea of the old earth. But wait, creation is clear that Adam and the animals and the plants and all the life started in the adult form, not an evolutionary one, not a one-celled animal that started to progress in, and, and as we know as evolution up to an ape and then finally into a man. We as Christians believe that the chicken came first and not the egg. And by the way, since God created every living thing in adult form, the chicken, not the egg, then why would the earth not be created in the adult think old form as well? Because God is God and we're not. And the trouble with scientists who purport to this theory, first of all, they're not genuine scientists. Because a genuine scientist will even tell you that how does something come out of nothing? It's impossible. They might not give credence to the God of the Bible or to intelligent design. They have to give credence to something. It's God. God does it. If you want to hear something foolish, think evolution and the Big Bang Theory. Stephen Hawking, supposedly one of the most brilliant men ever to live, and I'm going to quote from him. Quote, since events before the Big Bang have no observational consequences, one may as well cut them out of the theory and say that time began at the Big Bang. Events before the Big Bang are simply not defined because there's no way one could measure what happened at them. Under the question, how was the universe created, it states, the photons released decoupled when these atoms form can still be seen today. They form the cosmic microwave background, the CMB. As the universe expands, the energy density 
of electromagnetic radiation decreases more quickly than does uh, that of matter because the energy of photons decreases with the wavelength. I don't even know what I read. And I read that over about five times. I know you wanted me to slow that down for you, but I slowed it down for myself. It means nothing to me. So here's my questions. The photons released. Where did the photons come from? These atoms were formed. Where did the atoms come from? The photons? That's supposedly what the statement said, but where did the photon come? Where did it come from? How did it come? The photon definition is this, a particle representing a quantum of light or other electromagnetic radiation, a photon carries energy proportional to the radiation frequency, but has zero rest mass. I never liked science in class anyway. So where did the photon come from? If we had one Big Bang, then why didn't we have another Big Bang? And why is the Big Bang measurable, that Hawking said, but not before it? Why? Because he can't answer the question that there is a God, period. Whew. Science has three basic uh, vital rules. Falsifiability is rule number one. It's not a scientific theory unless it can be used to make a prediction and have that prediction turn out dead wrong. That's what it means to test something experimentally. A scientific hypothesis generates measurable predictions. Falsifiability means your hypothesis also has to survive rigorous attempts to find examples where the predictions are wrong. So the prediction is a big bang. So you have to create it? It has to happen again? Rep uh, replicability, Recli I can't say it. Uh, replicability, there it is. Not only does a scientific theory have to be testable, it's got to be a, a test anyone can repeat and get the same results. This is a law of science, number two. Therefore, the theory must be repeatable. Think the Big Bang. It only happened once. Why did it happen when it happened, and why did it happen only once? I've asked these questions until I'm blue in the face, and no one has ever given an answer. Number three, correlation is not causation. Example, as a child, did you think that going to bed at night caused the sun to come up in the morning? Correlation, the sun comes up after you've gone to bed. It's not the causation. Therefore, science has a rule that just because something is correlated and something else doesn't mean it caused the something else. <laughs> so under these three rules of science, the Big Bang Theory doesn't hold up. What I want to know is who created everything today. If the Big Bang is true, then how does an explosion promote order and not disorder? Every explosion you have ever seen does not create, it destroys. <clears throat> now let me just throw something in here. The reason why they say the Big Bang, because they think you're so stupid, that you're going to buy into because a scientist said it. Let me tell you something. If someone is supposed to be real smart, they better explain it to me. For instance, I go into my doctor. And when I went into my doctor, he said, you need a shoulder replacement. And I asked him, I said, why do I need a shoulder replacement? And he brought out his little model. And he said, see the model? You see that thing called a cartilage? You have none left. I said, can you make a cartilage? Can't do that. Can you stick something in there to act like a cartilage? He said, we tried that years ago. It didn't work. He said, so we have to replace it. And I said, what does that mean? And he explained everything going into it. Because I'm not going to have something done to my body if I don't understand it. And so if you are a teacher, 
If you are a doctor and you're going to do something, I want to know every if, ands, and buts. I want to know the percentage that it's not going to work. I want to know everything about it. But as soon as we hear the scientist Stephen Hawking said, oh, God is speaking. No, he's not. This is where God speaks. <laughs> The second law of thermodynamics, it's part of, if you had biology or earth science, you probably had this. Is, but you don't remember, so I'll repeat it here. <laughs> the second law of thermodynamics is a fundamental truth about the tendency towards disorder in the absence of intelligent intervention. The universe is constantly getting more disorderly. Okay? Example, that's the law. That's a law, a, a scientific law. We have to work to straighten out a room, but left to itself, it becomes a mess again very quickly and very easily. Even if we never enter the room, it becomes dusty and musty. Disorder. All we have to do is nothing, and everything deteriorates, collapses, breaks down, wears out all by itself. Go with me, please, and we'll be going back to Genesis 2, but go with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1 and verses 10 and 11. Hebrews chapter 1 and verses 10 and 11. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, it says, And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain, and they will all grow old like a garment. Wow. Whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, I think Paul wrote it. Paul wrote this thing not being a scientist, not knowing anything, but it's because it's God's word. The Holy Spirit told Paul what to write, and guess what? God was right. It's wearing out. Your brand new home you move into and you don't do anything about it, pretty soon it's not a new home anymore. You need to paint it, you need to fix it, you need to fix the toilet, you need to fix that and you need to redo this and redo that. Whew. The Bible makes it clear and since we believe in creation and not evolution, we see that the world has been deteriorating since creation. I want you to note that. I, I, I could hardly wait to see what Adam and Eve look like because I'll tell you what, they're the direct creation of God. I know what I look like in the mirror. I go, oh! But Adam was totally, you talk about a handsome guy and Eve, man, what a knockout. The direct creation from God. And now look what we look like. Just a joke. The next thing that I think could happen, not just that it was an old earth, is something that I call the gap theory. Genesis chapter 1, and let's go back there please, verses 1 and 2, the gap theory. This is still creation. We're not discounting creation whatsoever. We're trying to put things in order here. Chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2, the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. Okay? We have these words, in the beginning God created. How old is in the beginning? I have no idea. Then in verse 2 we have the words, without form and void. It means a wasteland, emptiness, and chaos. Take your Bibles and turn over to Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 45. I love this Bible verse here, chapter 45, verse 18. And it talks about this. Verse 18 in chapter 45 says this. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who established it, who did not create it, in vain or in waste. 
He did not create it in waste. Who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is no other. Is this amazing or what? It says in our Bible very, very clearly here that it was not done in waste. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. When he created the heavens and the earth, it was not day one. Day one didn't come yet. It did not come yet. The gap theory goes back to a Dutchman, uh, Epicopius, in the early 1600s, and was most brought forth by Thomas Chamlers in 1800, and was further popular, popularized by C.I. Schofield in his popular study Bible. I grew up on the Schofield Bible. In 1960, the Institute for Creation Research poo-pooed the idea with his founder, Henry Morris, and he wrote this, it is time for those who believe the Bible and in the goodness and wisdom of God to abandon the gap theory once and for all and simply believe that God has said. The gap theory has no scientific merit, requires a very forced biblical exegesis and leads to a God dishonoring theology. It does not work either biblically or scientifically. So my question for him is, so what does it do biblically? When Mar said biblically and scientifically, the first thing was, one must note is that science denies creation. When he says biblically, does that mean his interpretation or his understanding of a biblical principle that he can't see? I like Mars. That's not the problem. He's done a lot of good work. But to make that blanket statement, he needs to answer some questions for me. And he does not answer these questions. So let's look at these ideas and then you decide for yourself. God created everything in an adult form. Therefore, the so-called old earth means nothing to him. And if the world is between 6,000, 10,000 years old, there's absolutely no problem. You can do all the carbon uh, uh, testing that you want on it, and it'll come out old. So what? What does that mean? You know, he created, he created in adult stages. Doesn't mean anything. Actually, the planets were created after in the beginning, and yet a lot of planets are on different ages and the stars and everything else. It means nothing. Everything that God has created has been done perfectly. Everything. Perfect. And then he says it is good. So why would God create something formless and voidless? Answer that question for me. You can't. And neither can Mr. Morris. God doesn't need time to create or to fashion something like a lump of clay into place. My question is, God, what took you so long? Why did it take you six days to create? He did it for order. That was for the reason and the purpose. Now, you don't have to believe in the gap theory. You can believe just in the, the uh, creation, as I said. There's no problem to that. Therefore, do we think that he made the earth in a formless, voidish mode and fashioned it? And by the way, verse 1 is not the first day. So go back to Genesis chapter 1, and let's look at uh, verses 3 to 5. And it says, then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Wait a minute, the sun wasn't there yet. How's there light? That's not very scientific, Mahood. And God saw the light, and he said it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Not in the beginning was the first day. It was the light from the darkness was the first day. In the beginning has no time assigned to it. So now we'll go back here, but we have to take a little bit uh, of a sabbatical so you can understand what we're going into next, okay? Let's go to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. As you turn in Isaiah chapter 14, we realize that God is in heaven. He also created the angel population. The angel population was created. They're created beings. You know some of the angels as Gabriel, as Michael, the archangel, correct? Another angel that you know by the name is Lucifer, okay? Lucifer was the head of all the angels. He was actually the one 
that all angels had, a, had, a, had to answer to, Lucifer. And so look at here his fall. They were all created with a free will like you and like me. We have a free will as well, so the angels had a free will. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 15. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. <clears throat> How you are cut down to the ground, you uh, who weakened the nations, for you have said in your heart, here are the five I wills. This is what he sinned. And here are the five I wills of Satan. I will ascend into the heavens. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, above, above the angels of God. I will also sit on the mount of a congregation on the further side of the mountain. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high God. I am going to be God. That's what he said. Well, that was short-lived. <laughs> now, in the future, it says, and yet you should be brought down to Sheol, Hades, hell, to the lowest depths of the pit, Tartarus. <clears throat> and that's what happens. Now, I want you to turn to Ezekiel chapter. We have to take them together, okay? Ezekiel, Daniel, if that helps you out. If it doesn't, look in your concordance. Ezekiel chapter 28. And look at verses 13 to 17. And it says, You, Satan, Lucifer, were in the garden of Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone which you're covering, the sardius, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, emerald with gold, the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day, Satan, that you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I establish you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways when the day that you, Satan, were created. I'm adding the Satan so you can understand it. Till iniquity was found in you. See Isaiah that we just read. By the abundance of your trading and became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground, to the earth. I laid you before kings that they might gaze on you. Satan, my friend, was not cast down to hell. He was cast down to the earth. With the third of the angel population that went with him and didn't trust in the Lord. It's amazing. This again shows that Satan was cast down to the earth and not hell, like many people think. The earth is his dwelling place. He will be bound in the pit for 1,000 years during the millennial kingdom. And then his final uh, abode, hell, the lake of fire, will be his resting place. So I have some questions. Questions. So what day was Satan cast down on? Well, that's really an interesting question. Let's go back to Genesis here. Genesis. And you can read all these days here. Okay. We already read uh, in, in verse, uh, chapter 1 and verse 3 to 5. That was the first day. Okay. Uh, let's see. Verse 6. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the water, and let it divide the water from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament and the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament the second day. Do we see Satan crashing down in this? Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together and so forth. He said it was good. And then we have, of course, the third day in verse 12. And the earth brought forth grass and herbs and the yield, the fruit and so forth, which in itself God said it was good. Verse 13, so the evening and the morning were the third day. And then God said in verse 14, let the lights in the firmament of the heavens 
be divided from day and night, and let there be a sign of seasons. He made the seasons. Then in verse uh, 16, it says that he made also the stars. And then he said, of course, the sun and the moon to rule over the day and night. And God said it was good. In verse 19, it was the fourth day. Okay. <coughs> then we have the fifth day coming, of course. And on the fifth day, it says, so God created great sea creatures and every living thing in verse 21 that moves, which was the water around according to the kind and every winged bird, the birds were created. And God saw that it was good. And then verse 23, so evening and the morning were the fifth day. I don't see Satan coming in and messing it up. One more day. Here we go. 24, then God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, the cattle and creeping things, beasts of the earth, and according to its kind, and it was so, and God made the beasts of the earth according to the kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth, and he said, it's good, and then God said, let us make man in our image. So the cattle and the land animals and mankind were created on the sixth day. There's no room for evolution. Same time. And God said it was good. But what I love is verse 31, then God saw everything that he made and indeed he said it was very good. Very good. So when was Satan cast down? Day one, light and time. Day two, permanent and the uh, separation of the sky and the waters. Day three, dry ground, bodies of water and plants. Day four, sun, moon, stars, and planets, light from the sun, before the sun. Day five, fish and birds. Day six, land, animals, and man. Therefore, Satan either fell on one of those days of creation or he fell to the earth, which was created before the first day, and if Satan would have fallen, surely he would have messed this place up because God does not create voidless or, 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 or wastefulness as we saw in Isaiah. All his works are perfect. What I think happened is that Satan fell to this perfect earth and he destroyed it. He made it formless. He took out his rage. He made it voidless. And then God said in verse 3, let there be light, and there was light. <sighs> because in the beginning doesn't give us a certain time. Therefore, Satan either fell on one of those days, according to Mars. I don't know when he fell. Because if in the beginning, verse 1 is actually the same time as verses 3 to 5, Satan had a fall to the earth. When did he fall to the earth? The gap theory says that the world was created perfectly and Satan took his fury out on, on it and made it formless and voidless because in the beginning doesn't give us a certain time element. You have to decide. You have to decide. Now, if you believe in the gap theory over here and you say, no, that's pooey, I believe over here, you know, just like Morris said, doesn't matter. It's creation, guys. I just like to, I have this type of mind. I got to put everything in order and everything has to make sense. And that's important. Whew. Then number three, Genesis chapter two and verse eight. God's creation was perfect in every way. Verse eight, the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden and there he put the man whom he had formed. This was the Garden of Eden, perfect in every way, just like all his other creations. Verse 9. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Man was created in innocence, not in a glorified body, just like the angel population. They had a free will to accept or reject. Verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. What was the first job? A farmer. There it is in the Bible. If you want to underline it and write down farmer. Whew. 
I am so tired of hearing that prostitution was the world's oldest uh, profession. Where do you get that garbage from? <sighs> Farmer. Man was to tend the garden, easy for Adam because there were no weeds, thorns, or thistles. Oh, I could be that gardener, huh? Plant the seeds. I got to tell you a story. This is really funny. So our dad was uh, a school teacher, but he had a lawn service, a garden business, in the summer when he was off from school. So we had about 50 customers or something. So I went off to college, and I came back, and he says, hey, can you help me with this? I got to go to this lady's house. We have to weed. I said, okay. So when he's driving, he's telling me this. He said, yeah, we planted brand new pack of Sandra and other crops and things, and we put it in, it looked beautiful, and she called me up and bawled me out. And I said, about what? She said, the weeds are coming up, they're not supposed to come up. I said, Dad, are you serious? He says, well, I will weed it a second time and tell her that's not how life works. Wow. I don't know, I mean, I, I, I run the tractor, you know, it looks so beautiful, the dirt, and all of a sudden the, it rains and the weeds come up. What's happening here? Okay. <laughs> Chapter 3 in verses 17 to 19, look what happened with the curse. Then to Adam he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you and say, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and dust you shall remain. return. Think of the roses without thorns in the Garden of Eden. Think of the mosquito that doesn't bite. Think of the lion that is not carnivorous. This is how Eden was unto mankind sinned. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, it says thorns and thistles, as we just read that. And then look at 22. Verse 22 says, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put, we put him his hand and lest he put out his hand and take out of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden. And then of course, as we read before, the cherubims guarded the entrance. This is when God made the edict for marriage between a man and a woman back there in chapter one. And he knew that they were gonna have children. And so it says here, to Eve in verse 16, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and conception and pain. You shall bring child, children. Your desire shall be to your husband and he shall rule over you. Not popular words today, are there? <clears throat> it is man's sin that got us into this predicament. It is, God's, it, is, it is God that made it perfect. It is man who sinned. It is man who caused us to shorten our lives. And so that if you live to be 70, 80, 90, maybe 100 years old, people say, wow, you're old. Well, what about Methuselah and Jared, 962, Methuselah, 969, Adam, what about him? God created our bodies to live forever, but sin interrupted it. It is man's sin that caused our imperfect earth today. If Adam didn't sin, we would still be like in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve were placed in the garden, Adam was already created and then placed into it. The outside of the garden was also perfect, but think of Eden as the home for Adam and Eve, okay? People say, well, what, what happened if they walked out of the garden? They can go in and out of the garden. It's just like my home is Wilton and we can go any place you want. But you still want to go back home. So Adam and Eve's home was Eden. Now today's message was a little bit different. A lot of information. 
But the whole thing that I like is this. Once you believe that the word of God is the word of God and that God cannot err and that the truth is in the word of God, then we accept it by faith. For the Bible says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. So what does that do to us? If you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, the Bible says your home will not be in heaven, it will be in hell. And all you have to do is realize that you're a sinner, you're sorry for your sin, realize Jesus died on the cross for you, and then invite him to come into your life. And the Bible says, and I give unto you eternal life and you shall never perish. That's the important thing. But the Bible is a magnificent book. It's all fit perfectly. And we rightly divide the word of God. Let's bow our heads, please, and close our eyes just for a moment. Just want to ask two questions. Question number one. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, would you like to trust him today? Just slip up your hand, please, and I can talk with you later. You'd like to make that decision today. Would you like to do that? Question number two. Please don't vacillate about the word of God. We don't have theistic evolution. He didn't create day one and then it evolved and day two and then it evolved. And actually the Hebrew, the word he is the word for day and it means a 24 hour period. Each day that he created them was a 24 hour period. But what that does for our faith is to say, yes, when God says it, I believe it. I may not understand it, but if God says it, I believe it. That's the important thing. Heavenly Father, we pray as we have the invitation. If there's a person here who needs to accept Christ as Savior, may it be done. If there's a person who needs to dedicate their life, we pray that they will also dedicate and say, Lord, have your will with my life. Take my life and let it be consecrated all for thee. That's the important thing. Bless now this invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand, please, as we sing on the invitation hymn, Have You Any Room for Jesus? As we sing it, please. Have you any room for Jesus? As in grace he calls again. Oh, today is time accepted. Don't forget a little fellowship right there.